in my way of thinking, public space is uh, perhaps the space where so general public can, can access, you know, whether it be privately owned property or say, um, uh, you know, public space as such, or even environments uh, like galleries and institutions or whatever the public has access to, a bit like um, in, in our instance where we, pro we own property but it's open to public um, and we uh, every month we have an exhibition which we hope we, we send over 1500 invitations to the public in general sense that we invite public to view the exhibitions and um, and participate in just in this visual uh, you know small board whether it be sculptures or paintings so that uh, uh, yeah we rely heavily on, pa on public to, to be patrons of our gallery because um, we need to of course the, the, the public to, to acquire the works the works that are on consignment from the artists mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and of course the gallery serves a purpose for where the artist doesn't have to promote themselves that the gallery um, creates a situation for public to, to view and purchase the works from. Mm -hmm. And what about the, um, the artist in terms of, like, if, you know, her, we were talking about uh, the artist as we were talking about earlier about memory yeah. of space and then the, that space changes because yeah. of time or whatever. Well, I can I can I can think about that sort of since my early very early childhood. Um, I was born and brought up uh, in uh, in Europe till the age of thirteen when we came to Australia. But my my early very early memories of um, of well of the similarity to what we're doing now of uh, art, sculpture, paintings um, that that I always remembered back in in a certain places or even in the environment where I was brought up. Um, memory of space that that contained these enormous sculptures and paintings and uh, a wonderful memory of um, of things that were you know sort of psychologically absorbed without even taking notice you don't even remember but uh, you always have the memory of that space and and the um, um, you know, of course, things that are very impressive for a younger, for a younger person, for a child, especially and when, you, when you're confronted by a larger than life, say sculptures or paintings of all these uh, very, well, I mean, in churches or in operas or whatever. There's a lot of history um, in in, the, in part of the part of the world where I was sort of like. Mm, so they, up, these you know? were put into places where people didn't have to pay to be part of it or be invited. To be part of that space itself. No, they were, they were, they were, they were open they to public. Yeah, yes, yeah, there were a, a, a lot of public places. I mean, for instance, even the the open markets, say in Ljubljana, where, where I was born, um, the open markets was was a, it actually still is um, an open square where people set up their stores in it, and the whole square is surrounded by frescoes uh, that have been constantly maintained, and um, enormous sculptures, and and it's all it's almost like. Part of the heritage and cultural background of that, of I mean, the history goes right back when the, and in the importance of its religious content and uh, would it be religious paintings and, and in, that, in that area was mainly a lot of uh, public work was uh, commissioned by the church, you know. So there was, yeah. but to me the visuals I can still visualize, I can still see that space. I can I can relate to that space because it left it left a, um, a, a wonderful memory of so, sometimes very. Um, very strong memory on, on that particular on those spaces and you know many spaces where because I travelled a lot well through especially through Europe and so on um, I have always absorbed so much more of say perhaps things that interest me the most and that is the the sculpture which was always in the open space a public space you know so you didn't have to go to museums uh, physically go into the building to um, to, to appreciate or to be absolutely, you know, blown away, but but it's sheer size of the artwork or frescoes and so on. Yeah. Is that still? Do you think that's happening in Western Australia? Do you think you could? People are still uh, experiencing that that taking away that memory as in their age mm. later on, or is that not occurring? In well, no, I think that there's a bit of a uh, bit of a sad situation of our. I mean, in from say from say 60s till now to 2000, like in the last 40 years. Um, what I have, what I have always remembered as being impressive and important uh, sculptures, say in Perth or in Terrace or whatever, you know, I always remembered the, the Howard Taylor's pieces, and unfortunately, um, they're, they're not there any longer because I think that um, 
the ownership of the space changed and um, I think that they, due to lack of maintenance they were sadly neglected and so on. Um, we, I, I find it very, very you know, sad because um, not just to me but I'm sure to a lot, a lot of people that uh, appreciate good quality art and see that removed just to be replaced by art, well, without being an art critic, you know, I think that um, the city of Perth is actually going backwards a little bit by removing both of those major how tailors, or say three pieces of how tailors, and then also removing that major piece that was outside the railway station, you know, which I felt was a quite a, an interesting contemporary piece, uh, kinetic well, I mean, it had the water spray and so on, and I just I found it very difficult to understand how those works could not be maintained, and, um, you know, maybe if they needed to be repositioned for whatever reason, you know, but still to be part of the uh, cultural heritage and the Perth scene, you know, so that's... Mm. Uh, but I still remember seeing that, uh, that, 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 that what is regarded as a teapot, this you know, you know, I can still remember it in that very tight uh, space where it was positioned, you know, um, and I understand due to some a bit of foresight, people like Paul Thompson, that it was uh, saved from being going to the tip, mm. which would have been really quite a, I think, a sad loss, you know, um, um, and I'm sure it'll probably come back again and uh, resurrect it as a wonderful memory for those people that always appreciate it. Mm. You're talking about public public space and private space, like the difference of, between private space and public space. How, yeah. how do you define uh, the space as in terms of if the public aren't able to visit the space without knowing that it's private, like yeah. you're talking about Central Park yeah. or... A space where it's a corporate space, but the public are invited to be part of it. How do you think it restricts their their appreciation of works that are commissioned to be in those spaces? Themselves? No, I, I don't think really. Um, when you're talking about public space and you're talking about private space and so on, um, I don't see a great deal of restriction on on the, on the general public that is interested in in particular things. Like for instance, a public that is interested in art and and are prepared to come to, to our gallery and so on. Now, nobody's restricted. If anything, we invite people, but it might be see, perceived in a different way by different people that have perhaps never been to a, a gallery or never been to that environment. You know, they're a bit sort of reluctant to even uh, come to the space there because they think, oh, that's private. So they're perceived as private as being out of bounds. Like, if, if it's an open space, let's say, if it's outside of... Um, uh, railway station, something that's automatically accepted as being private, you know. Mm -hmm. But just because you have a, uh, uh, I mean, this must be seen as being public, uh, uh, accessible to public. But just because you have a, a space that's say managed privately, you know, that is open to the public, you know, I think I don't think the public should sort of take, you know, perceive that as being a, a no-go zone, you know, especially if they, if you're showing or you're promoting or exhibiting artists. Where you actually, on a monthly basis, invite, send out, say, 1,500 invitations to, of, to public, um, or maybe sometimes to curators that uh, acquire works on behalf of the um, institutions and so on, you know. So I think it's only a perception that, that's not probably understood by those people that are a bit reluctant or a bit shy about seeing it as a, often, to the, often to the general public space, you know. Like uh, the collection that will commission an artist to create a piece in a specific space. Um, and it doesn't as well, you know, often the space is taken into consideration in the design of the of the actual of the actual piece. But in many cases, um, sculptors would prefer to create work and that work to be acquired on its own merit and then positioned in whatever environment, because you're talking about the actual artist's work. Uh, more so than creating a work to suit a space. In other words, if you're going to have a clickable sculpture, um, understanding that that is his work, it doesn't matter where you put it, you know, mm. it can still be appreciated and understood as his work, more so than work that was uh, created for the specific site, you know, because you, you have to appreciate his style of work and acknowledge his creativity, and, and that should be enough to be to be accommodated in any particular space. So it doesn't necessarily mean... So when people are considering that, they should be more mindful of the site-specific side of it, thinking about where that work will go, yeah. conceptually as well as physically? Yeah, and, and I mean, often you find that uh, certain artists get commissioned to do works to be site-specific, 
but then uh, the brain is so, you know, it's so open that they can pretty well develop anything and create just about anything because I think in most cases it's, it is much more important to let the artist create a piece of work that it becomes a signature of the work and actually it's identifiable as their work more so than we need some particular animal to be cut out and stuck on top of St. George Sterics, you know what I mean? Or we need mm-hmm. a figure or, you know, so that I think artists sometimes tend to compromise too much with what is actually expected, what is wanted, more so than their own integrity, what they really want to do. Mm-hmm. Because I think that's more important to have, say for instance, if you're going to have, if you get a commission, say someone like, without sort of putting any names, a particular artist that has a style, a particular style, you're not going to ask them to do something that is just not not their, uh, not their scene, mm-hmm. you know, they, just to get a commission. You know? and mm-hmm. I think too many artists compromise their own integrity by just wanting to have a commission and wanting to do a particular project and then they compromise what perhaps maybe is an idea from an architect or, or the actual um, you know, corporate um, sponsor or corporate person that's financing it. So they have this often compromise and I find a bit sad but yeah, sculptors especially sometimes they do compromise being commissioned to do a particular um, um, uh, a particular project, um, often often you create works because a client um, is actually wanting to commission you to do a particular um, uh, uh, sculpture uh, for a particular particular uh, space and so on. Um, it is a good example, like the client wanted uh, two horses done can you do it yes we can do it and this is this is a project that I um, uh, worked together on with uh, um, with a fellow artist um, Bill Rees and um, and and the actual project was uh, a quite a challenge because uh, we're not really uh, I'm not personally um, d- doing a great deal of large figurative work, but this was one of the projects that uh, was too good of an opportunity so, to miss so, out on. So commissioned work uh, from a private private uh, collective, yeah. but uh, then what about in terms of works that the, the, the current governments or current movements for you know, art sourcing agencies and so on... Yeah. Are, are you seeing any of the sort of same scale as like private people are doing it? It used to be the church, yeah, private yeah. concern. Yeah. How are the government taking on that whole idea? Well, there is very. I mean, there, there, there seem to be perhaps more commissions given now in sculpture now than perhaps in the last say, like four or five years than ever before. Um, so there, there is uh, much more, uh, much more swing towards three-dimensional outdoor large sculptural uh, work. Um, in Perth, you know, there are there are a few sculptors that are that are very very uh, fortunate to be able to secure commissions, ongoing commissions. You know, um, in my situation, is that is that about in house stuff, or is it, you know, just about the fact that they are capable of doing it, or what, why are they um, getting the repetitive? Well, yeah, issues? I mean, yeah, that's that's a, that's really sometimes a bit of a touchy subject because. Um, um, there are many reasons why uh, perhaps three or four uh, sculptors continue to get uh, to get major commissions because sometimes the um, expression of interest is made in such a way that you don't need to apply for it unless you've done three major commissions. And uh, there are not many artists that have done one or let alone three major commissions. So it becomes a bit of an in-house sort of a situation: um, who gets major commissions and who doesn't, or who ends up making the large commissions for other artists and uh, uh, a lot of my income has been generated through creating a lot of um, sculpture for other artists you know which mm. is sometimes a necessity for for us to keep the gallery going uh, as it generates income but um, it, it most definitely creates a lot of frustration for me in my work because I would dearly love to be able to just get on with my work with and my stuff. Own, so instead of um, having to create the cash flow to keep the gallery going. The, ma- the, major, the major problem with, with the larger works is that um, very few people from, say, from the corporate sector can really relate to its importance as its culturally or importance um, uh, as in, as in, as in um, 
contemporary contemporary way of thinking, looking, and understanding uh, whether it's a national or international art. Because this is this is uh, a Philip King piece, and Philip King is of course a, um, a British or English uh, sculptor. Um, and this piece uh, was done about 30 years ago. And uh, 30 years ago, to, to I mean, this was just like a um, a whole new wave of of um, of, of contemporary. Uh, English sculpture that was um, sort of gone beyond um, traditional sort of like Henry, Barbara Hepburn, uh, Henry Moore work and um, this piece has been actually in Australia for about 30 years um, part of that time was actually on loan to the Art Gallery in New South Wales but when it started to um, desperately need some maintenance um, it was then put in storage and um, and never to be seen again so we we were actually fortunate enough to be able to restore it and we have it on loan to the gallery grounds here um, as being a quite a major major uh, contemporary piece by this very important um, English sculptor people like uh, David Jones and Nina Schwartz and um, you know uh, Midland Tafe uh, lectures where the opportunity is that that they can they can actually create what they would feel an ideal or oh, their interpretation of, of making the space whether it be in the hollow or in the sand uh, pile there or even on the other side creek to create a piece that would be totally open to the interpretation to what would be the, the uh, you know ideal situation for an environment um, and to be as contemporary or to bring up as many ideas as they possibly can and then turn that into a, uh, a either installation or a or a piece that's actually created in their in their own environment or their studio, and then install it on site. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of pieces. It almost does look like a bit of a graveyard in some of the pieces that have been here for about uh, four or five years. And uh, we're quite ha happy to have those pieces here, um, just to see how how they, they um, you know how the whole place sort of starts to relate around those works. They, they never date. They, they're still as as wonderfully, you know, put together ideas as they were on a day they were installed. Yeah. Now I will do it. It's going to happen because I feel that I would let it be letting myself down if I didn't yeah. restore it, you know, and and uh, and have it back to its original um, uh, to to its original. Um, so it's just primarily maintenance why it fell apart, as in. Well, just because people don't have a respect respect to keep things going. Yeah. Or? Well, maintenance was the biggest problem. I think that um, it wasn't even it wasn't even political. It was just simply laziness and lack of lack of total lack of regard for its importance uh, and uh, for what what it was as an interesting contemporary piece in a very central position. You know, it was mm. very. Uh, important position, I think, for the commuters to the railway station and so on. I think the excuse was that people were getting wet from the spray. You know, I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty silly because a bit like saying that the fountains in Rome, people, you know, should be closed down because people put their feet in it. You know, like that could spread bacteria or something. You know, I mean, that's stupidity. You know, but uh, we have all the components, and uh, it will come back together again. Um, I hope sooner than later because it is an important. Uh, important piece um, historically, historically, Cul and, and culturally and as well. Culturally as well, because um, um, they, they they should be they should be in very integral and very important part of our um, you know uh, our uh, cultural sort of uh, part of, of Perth, city of Perth. Because mm. I think, in my way of thinking, there's, they've taken down a lot of interesting contemporary pieces just to be replaced by um, by sculpture that's perhaps I don't know um, very difficult for me to sort of to, 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 to keep going on about that subject because uh, you know we're doing a lot of work here that some of the major institutions should be doing that's further encourage both students and the senior sculptors of Western Australian you know sort of, of, of art scene to, to create works and to, to further encourage that sort of, um, you know, um, that, that, that culture, cultural sort of um, con continuation, you know, of, of, of the, um, uh, of three dimensional, especially three dimensional um, uh, work. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that's it. Begging the institution or begging the, the corporation to do what you need to do to create, speak volumes. Well, yeah, we just, I think in all the time we've been here, it's just been, we just keep thinking that we hope that we can make some difference. You know, in other words, to do something from positive end and to create a situation where if you have encouraged or if you have um, helped someone along the way, even one person or even two people of all of 20 years of uh, promoting and, and exhibiting sculpture, that you would then be successful in the sense that at least you achieved on a very small percentage. But it's still a positive, it's a positive, um, you know, uh, feedback or it's a positive thing that you have done you know in other words we did make some small difference you know